Hello, everybody. Yes, you are there, outside the gloom. Um, I haven't planned a speech today, so thank you. I'll add a bit about Brexit. Um, we don't get out much at Lush, so I don't talk very often, um, especially when people ask us to come and talk about our ethical company. You just did the bad thing there and called us ethical, because we don't like to call ourselves an ethical company. We resist it as much as we can, because we don't believe we're ethical. We believe we're normal. Um, and that companies should be run along normal human values. You know, it's like... <laughs> you know, it's like that thing where you used to see a little notice in the coffee shop saying that you could ask for fair trade coffee, and then you look at the rest of the menu and think, what's the rest of it then? Um, and I, I think like that about people calling us ethical. You know, God knows what the rest is like, because um, we struggle. <laughs> So everyone else must be in the mire. So I was asked to talk a little bit about how the company started. Um, Lush started in 1995 with one, one little tiny shop in Poole in Dorset. And we now have, I think, about 1,000 shops. Um, we're in 49 countries. So a, a global business in 21 years. Actually, we became global in year two, but uh, by accident more than design. Um, so I guess the... I'll, I'll say we when I'm talking about this, but don't think that means I did it. I, I was lucky enough to get a job with Lush in the first month of their existence when they sort of thought they needed three or four staff to help them do this. I happened to rack along needing a job. Um, so when I say we, I mean they. I, I just like to take a bit of the credit. Um, so I guess um, the, the five people, the founders of Lush, um, started the company in 1995, but to explain it, I really need to go back a bit further, quite a bit further, they're old, um, to, I guess, the kind of mid to late 1970s, where Mark Constantine, one of the Lush owners, trained after leaving school, he was training to be a trichologist, um, uh, they don't really exist much anymore, trichologists, but they, they were um, uh, often based in hairdressers, sometimes had separate salons. It was to do with scalp diseases. So he was taught to identify, recognize, and treat scalp diseases, and part of that was making the products and the lotions and the creams and the shampoos yourself in those days to do that. So that's where his basic knowledge of products came from. And then he was based in a very big salon doing that job after he'd qualified. And he instantly became really concerned about the products that he was using on people's hair in those salons. It was the 1970s, and we'd had the white heat of technology that governments were talking about. So everything, everyone was looking to science for answers, and everything was getting chemically and, 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 and sort of you know, moving away from nature, and he's a bit of a hippie. Um, so he was incredibly concerned that the stuff that he was putting or that he was seeing being put on people's scalps, you know, the perming lotions, the colors, those kind of things, even the shampoos in those days, were quite harsh and were causing a lot of the problems he saw. So he started his own business very early um, and started making his own products. And he started teaching himself all the more about herbs and essential oils and all the nice things in nature. And they opened their own little beauty salon. Him, he talked one of the other girls that was working into giving up her steady job and taking a risk with him. And they bought this, or they, they rented, uh, a tiny little shop, which we, we're still operating out of today, in Poole in Dorset on the Quay. And they started a business called the Herbal Hair and Beauty Clinic. And um, Liz did all the facials, Mark did all the, um, the head, the, hairdressing and he made all the products and then I guess the next bit of the story is that Mark was reading a magazine one day and read an article about a lady who started a shop and she was just opening her second shop and she was concerned about the ingredients in products and uh, she getting the bottles she customers could bring stuff back and refill and he thought it sort of sounded a bit like him and Liz so he tracked her down and went to see her and said, look, you know, here's a bunch of stuff I make. You might like to sell it in your shop. And she liked it. And she ordered some. Um, she, I think she ordered about £300 worth. And Mark tells the story that he got on the train um, 
to, uh, you know, after the meeting, and he was on the train home thinking, oh, shit, <laughs> how am I going to make 400, three, 400 pounds worth of stuff? He'd only ever done enough for him and Liz to last a few days. Um, and apparently, when he got to know the lady, she said to him that as he was going away, she was thinking, shit, where am I going to find 300 pounds from <laughs> to pay this guy for this stuff? I've just recklessly ordered. Um, but anyway, she found the money. He managed to make the stuff in the spare bedroom at home. Um, and a business relationship started that went on for about the next 15 years where he made and supplied products for her fast expanding um, chain of shops. And that chain of shops was the body shop, uh, which went global, as you know, and was probably the biggest retail story in British history in our generation. Uh, so you can imagine from that tiny beginning to supplying the body shop was, was very big. They, as I say, they probably supplied about 50% of what we all know on the shelves from those heydays. And that relationship went on for a long time. It ended, I guess, when it, in the years running up to the body shop being floated, uh, they were having uh, auditors in and advice coming in. And part of the advice they got was that it was very dangerous for a company in their their size and state, to rely on one supplier for the invention and manufacture of their products for such a large part of their range. So at that stage, um, the, the business and Anita did a deal and she bought the formulas off them and built a factory and started making the products herself and put in R&D and started inventing their own products. So the two companies went their own ways amicably. Um, and at that stage, the old team that they'd gathered around themselves since that early days with the body shop had got obviously rather larger, decided to do their own brand. But part of the deal with the body shop, there was a restraint of trade um, that in that deal and buying the formulas, they said that uh, and had signed up to an agreement that they wouldn't open shops because obviously body shop don't want their supplier to go out in um, in competition with them. So there was a restraint of trade for, I, I think it was five years or so. Uh, it may have been ten years. No, I think it was five. So they started their own business, and it was, it was an amazing business. They were able to put a lot of the products that had been rejected by Body Shop and had nowhere to go. They'd do the creation, and um, Body Shop would choose what suited their range. Um, but obviously that means you invent a lot of stuff that has nowhere to go, and suddenly that had somewhere to go in the new business, which was called Cosmetics To Go, um, which was just a paper mail order business in pre-internet days. It was a little catalogue that went out to people's letterboxes, and they wrote you a check and a little list of what they wanted back. And that's an incredibly difficult business to grow, and it, it went the way um, that so many businesses go. It, it went bankrupt quite quickly. Uh, I think it was only about three years uh, for the money to go and for the company to go completely bust and everyone lost everything. Um, so those were tough times. Um, but what they had was uh, a whole career of working for themselves and doing things the way they wanted to do it and having very strong opinions. Um, what I should have also told you is that um, the owners of Lush, Mark and his wife Mo, were also environmental campaigners. They were activists in their teens. I told you they were hippies, so that's pretty obvious. They were you know, taking part in sit-down protests and that kind of thing. Um, so they had those very strong concerns about the world. Um, and they'd built a business kind of expressing that through their products. So it was difficult when they went bankrupt to kind of think, where do we go next? And I guess the only thing to do was to start another business, but uh, it was so difficult. And for those of us that were joining them at that stage, at the, you know, right in the middle of the bankruptcy, I, I came in. Uh, there was no money. There was no help. Banks didn't want to touch them. There was no, you know, sort of no, no loans. No, uh, we, we couldn't buy ingredients without paying up front because obviously all the cosmetic suppliers, the ingredient suppliers all knew they'd gone bust. So no one trusted um, an order, a normal business order from them, everything was difficult. Uh, they didn't take any pay themselves. Uh, they could barely pay those of us that were, the three or four of us that were working for them. So tough times to get a business off the ground. Um, and uh, sort of coming along at that time, I, I thought I was just 
doing a little job making soap. And I, originally, I was making the soap and pressing the bath bombs. And I guess, having seen the body shop and worked through that, there was no way that they were going to build a little business and keep it in the shed. It was literally in the shed in the garden and this tiny shop in Poole that we were, we were making products out of the shed. So they had a vision, um, but were very fearful and very damaged from the bankruptcy, lost a lot of confidence, but really wanted to build it back up. But alongside wanting to build it back up, they didn't want to... I think for the first time ever, with the restraint of trade was just almost coming to an end. And without having to, you know, sort of be restricted by only mail order or restricted by making products for someone else's vision of their brand, if they were going to start lush again from a bankruptcy, and, and it was a very fearful step, and I used to see the fear in their eyes every day when I went into work, if they were going to do that, it had to be something that they believed in fully, that fully um, encapsulated everything that they wanted to do, all of their future wishes and hopes, everything they wanted to do as a business, and everything they wanted to have in their products that made them proud of their business. Because you, you're not proud of going bankrupt and everyone losing their jobs and people losing their cars and homes off the back of it, which is what happened. So they wrote a We Believe statement on the first day when they sat there and decided, the five of them, to open back up and try again. And they kind of run the company by that ever since. But certainly, the products had to... We, we talk about... Uh, sometimes we ask each other, are you able to look at yourself in the bathroom mirror in the morning at the moment? Because I think that's kind of... There wasn't a big strategy and there isn't a load of written stuff at Lush. It's about us feeling comfortable with the business and comfortable with ourselves within that business and proud of the product. And I think if you're proud of your product, you can talk about it enthusiastically and then everything else falls into place. The, the customer's going to love it because you've poured everything into it. The staff are going to feel happy making it and selling it to customers. So there's no inhibition about our product. We love it, we trust it, we believe in it. Um, and that's why the company's grown. You know, we've, we've never advertised. You know, people are always shocked um, and, and often don't believe us when we say that we've never advertised and we've never had a marketing department. Uh, we always believed that if we made a good product, people would buy it and they'd tell their friends and family. And that is exactly what's happened. So the company, you know, has always been interested in fair trade. It's always been vegetarian. It's always, always hated animal testing. Um, from the start of Mark's career, he told Anita that his products weren't tested and they never would be and she should look at her other suppliers. So that's where that all started. Um, so all of those values are in there. They're all so intrinsic, but then there was that sort of flows through to everything else. So the hiring of people um, I was also asked to, to bring into this was also something that Lush has never, until recently actually, we've never had job titles and never hired for qualifications. People have come along and if they're enthusiastic, they get taken into the company. It's about attitude and enthusiasm. Uh, and, and later, as people got to know the product, about belief in the product, it's great to have that in the staff when they come in. Um, and no job titles, no job roles, no sort of contracts and job descriptions and things that, that tie you into this tiny little box. Um, people have been able to come in and sort of create their own roles by seeing things they think the company should do and just getting on and doing them. Uh, we are noticing that the new generation like job titles. Uh, I personally blame LinkedIn. Um, <laughs> I really do. I think um, people struggle to know how to describe themselves on it, so we're suddenly finding there are quite specific job roles creeping in. People are writing them for themselves, so... Fair dues, but um, <laughs> it's all a bit odd. So that that was all, yeah, that was all part of the growth of Lush. Was this kind of loose, um, this loose uh, bunch of people who came together because we all kind of believed in in what we were doing and enjoyed it. And we have a great deal of fun at Lush. Um, we take the product seriously, but not ourselves. Um, and I think that also comes through, and hopefully you'll see that in the pictures behind as well, that, you know, sort of it's a great deal of fun on a day-to-day -day basis. We, as we got bigger, 
they try to buy us up. Um, the bigger companies start, you know, it's like having, you know, sort of um, vultures coming around at a certain stage. But part of how Lush has been able to keep itself, you know, on track, doing the things we want to do is to not have outside shareholders dictating to us about how we make money and where we make the money. We, we can flash our cash wherever we want. We can buy expensive ingredients. And over the years, as we've got bigger, we find that the values don't decrease. They increase because we have more money to carry out our beliefs. So we've gone from fair trade to working with our our growers to do permaculture and then permaculture wasn't enough we wanted to move into regeneration so we're talking about making sure that the land where people are growing things is becoming more fertile it's be it's starting to grow a greater amount of things giving more security to those communities so those kind of things are uh, progressing much more with Lush. In the animal testing, we're starting to, uh, we give away a quarter of a million in prize money every year to the people inventing alternatives to animal tests. I think, and another thing that we did is, you know, you, you kind of get to a stage where you look around and you think, oh my God, you know, did we really just build all that? Um, suddenly we had this huge, huge company that we'd somehow, you know, we'd been beavering away and throwing ourselves into it and it had grown to this massive thing. And at that stage, you turn around and think, okay, we've got these resources. When we were activists, when we were younger, we'd have dreamt of this, these high street shops on the busiest streets in, in the world. We're right across the world. So at a certain stage in our history, we turned those resources over to the activists and said, what would you like in our windows? If we gave the window to you for two weeks, what would you like in there? Um, if we could make a product, who would you like us to give the money to? Um, and we've been able to control that as well because it's not a marketing exercise. We don't talk about it. So we can make sure that the money goes to grassroots activists. It doesn't have to be some all singing, all dancing thing that, you know, sort of we don't have to stick with big NGOs and big charities because we want to please our customer base and be bland and inoffensive. Uh, we, we simply don't care. If we believe in it, we'll fund it. Um, so our money has been able to go to entirely different, it's a different process. Um, it gets us into trouble, so often the things that we fund are quite controversial, um, and we stumble along from, from one social media crisis to the next. It was, um, it was uh, last week, it was um, the, the Chinese had noticed that we were funding a lot of Tibetan freedom groups. So we, um, we had some millions and millions of hits on Weibo um, slagging us off. Um, the week before that, we wouldn't put a Christian poster on one of our notice boards in one of our shops. So we have constant, um, constant little battles to fight um, to keep on track so that we can keep supporting the things that we, we really care about. And I think I've run out of time, probably. <laughs> Do you want me to wrap up? One more, so why, why, one more thing, okay. Um, if, if I could say one more thing, it would be that I was talking to a group of students a, a few weeks ago um, on, on World Peace Day, and they asked me to challenge them with something at the end of my speech. So I, I kind of pointed out, and I've been thinking about it a lot since, it was a spontaneous comment that we all worry about politics um, and who's gonna be in power and who's gonna be making the decisions. But when you think about it, we give about a quarter of our wages to the politicians to make their policies and, and do, their, do their thing with. The other three quarters of our, the money, the hard-earned money that we all have, goes to companies. And they spend that money shaping the world in much more fundamental ways than the government do. The governments, I think, are kind of like a, a port authority. They control when the boats dock. But those businesses are out there sailing those oceans uncharted. So what they're doing out there is hidden away from view. How they trade, you know, they cr can crap all over the environment. They can, they can oppress and abuse minorities and they can, uh, they can use underdeveloped parts of the world to produce ingredients for us in a, in a very unethical way. And I think that it's up to all of us to start thinking about those three quarters of our wages and holding them to account in the same way that we hold our politicians to account. And then we can see some change. Thank you.